So I know wherein I speak. When I speak about alien abductions, and particularly encounters with reptilians, I can develop an instant kinship and understanding with others who have experienced the same things. My colleagues and I have always taken the approach of being friends first, researchers later, because people will only open up to you if they know that you have a vested emotional interest in them. Too often, researchers use the information from an abductee or someone who's you know, had anomalous experiences, and then after their book is written, they discard them. They become just baggage. Well, we don't do that. What we do is we, we work long term with the people we're involved with. My mentor is Barbara Bartholik, in my opinion, the greatest alien abduction researcher on this planet. She has had a number of protégés, some of them you may have heard of, the late, great Dr. Carla Turner, candy to her friends. Uh, Jim Walden, he, he uh, co-wrote a book uh, with Barbara Bartholik. She helped substantially in the creation of his book. He writes about his own experiences as, for all intents and purposes, a host of a reptilian entity, an interdimensional reptilian entity, which I will explain the mechanics behind that in a moment. Uh, Eve Lorgan, Evelyn Lorgan, is a close colleague of mine who ha has uh, studied at the feet of Barbara Bartholik, in particular the subject of what, are known as, what is known as the alien love bite. Now this may seem somewhat comical to, to those who don't know any better, but, and I will elaborate on this more, but we are emitters, we are resonators. And what some of these negative beings strive to do is engender negative emotions and feelings within us of anguish, of pain, of misery, of isolation and hopelessness. What the alien love bite is, 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 what it is it's a setting up of a, of a love bonding drama between, between two abductees, oftentimes bonded from childhood, where they're abducted and re-abducted, and as they grow older, uh, oftentimes not knowing of the existence of the other, they've already developed strong astral connections and strong subconscious connections. And then decades later, uh, Jack and Jill, let's say, meet at a, a UFO conference, very common, and then an instant chemistry, an instant bond between them develops, where they feel that they've had sexual relations with one another. They have extreme close body, like uh, chemical reactions with one another. They begin to psychically develop uh, uh, communication with each other. And then one of the outcomes of that is that a, an emotional unplugging occurs where one is left in an un unrequited state because they can't consummate the relationship, because they may be married. But the bottom line, the reason for this is to engender extreme emotions of uh, misery, unhappiness, unrequited love. And these beings, they feed off that. They feed off that in the way you or I nurture ourselves on, on food or protein or what have you. These beings literally strive to create n negative situations in our life for a number of reasons, but mostly to feed off of us. Now, there are four subjects I will discuss today. In general, I'm here to talk about the reptilian overlordship. The reptilian overlordship, the proof of which is all around us. The global institutionalized sex slavery, the, uh, the wars and the rumors of wars, the designer plagues. Uh, all of these things are part and parcel. Uh, the, the rapidly advancing uh, movement towards global centralized control uh, the privatization of water, uh, genetically modified foods, all these things are part and parcel of the reptilian overlordship. They are around us. We, s we see this all the time. But people just don't realize that there is a controlling factor behind all of it. Uh, the tendency on the part of some conspiracy researchers is to ascribe all, all these activities uh, on the part of power-mad bankers, power-mad humans. But uh, I promise you that the... Uh, not only the conception, but the execution of this uh, advancing global, globalized, centralized agenda was thousands of years in the making, and, uh, and a purely human consciousness cannot conceive of, let alone, affect these changes. Because if you have any understanding of, of metaphysics at all, you will know that everything manifests first in the spiritual realms before they manifest in the physical realms. That's just the way it is. A simple thought 
followed by an action is, is just a, one very basic example. How else is the reptilian overlordship manifested to us? Oh, vulgarity, extreme vulgarity. Uh, movies like Jackass are, are, have become hits. Um, uh, all these efforts at promoting vulgarity as the norm in our society. Uh, the occultic symbology, my friend Jordan Maxwell out there in, in the convention hall, he is the foremost expert on, the occultic, on occultic symbology, and he's had his information borrowed and stolen constantly. In fact, uh, the Tom Hanks character in the movie Da Vinci Code is a pale imitation of, of Jordan Maxwell. And you see the symbol symbology when you walk down the aisles of a supermarket. Uh, every time you see a obelisk, you're looking at a representation of a reptilian phallus. Uh, in other words, they're just sticking it to you and you don't even realize it. It's there in front of you. Okay. That's the reptilian overlordship in a nutshell, which I'll elaborate on more later. The four aspects of the reptilian overlordship I will talk about are, one, the reptilians and their modus operandi. Two, the hybrid hosting process, which is the fundamental building block, the fundamental basis for the reptilian overlordship. Three, my labs, which are legitimate alien abductees who have uh, been utilized by deep black elements of the military intelligence community as covert operatives because of innate abilities they have, paraphysical abilities. Um, all abductees are part of a, a particular bloodlines, and many of these my labs have latent paraphysical capabilities because, precisely because they've been utilized and uh, genetically modified and upgraded, if you will, by various and sundry alien groups, particularly the reptilians. And the fourth thing I will talk about, I will, I will tie up all those three subjects at the end. Now, the first thing I will talk about is the reptilians. There are essentially two types of reptilians. There's the space-faring reptilians. They literally fly around in spaceships. And then there are the, what's been described as the inner terrestrials uh, that live within the Earth that are essentially native to this planet. They've been here as long as or longer than we have. And these beings have uh, developed over time an interdimensional capability. They are masters of frequency and resonance. They can alter their, des their density. The reptilians have attained control of the surface through a mastery of genetics, through control of the human gene pool, modifying the human race in general and particular bloodlines in particular to the point where they develop attributes, behaviors, and capabilities which advance the reptilian agenda on the surface. The reptilians come in a number of different shapes and sizes. Some are rather small, four to four and a half to five feet tall. More commonly, they're six feet tall and, and taller. Some as high as seven, seven and a half feet tall. They can be a number of colors, like dark green. Uh, they can be brownish what's been described as pea soup green. There's a particular type of reptilian species we refer to as the yellow bellies. There are many reptil reptile type species on the surface, like crocodiles and alligators that have a tannish or a whitish underside. There are literally reptilians that have a whitish or a tannish underside. We call them yellow bellies. And these reptilians over time have developed the ability to, like I said, they can alter their, their density. Now, how do they interact with the humans? Well, let's start with how reptilians interact with females, human females. Now, most of these human females that have encounters with reptilians are in all likelihood uh, reptilian hybrids to a degree themselves. I refer to them as reptilian familiars familiar in the family sense, the generational sense. These reptilians will follow certain bloodlines generation after generation. And when a woman is having encounters with reptilians, it's because she's been genetically modified to the point where she is suitable uh, for a reptilian to access for purposes of, of mating or, or what have you. Now, how does a reptilian rape a human woman? Let's say a woman is sleeping.